My name is Devin Manibo, and I am the marketing manager at Center for Book Arts. I am tuning in from Brooklyn, as I said, the traditional unceded territory of Lenape, Rockaway, and Canarsie peoples. In the words of my mentor and dear friend Jack Pryor, it must be our intention that our work is in service to the rightful return of the land to its peoples and towards healing, justice, and liberation for all. We encourage you to also let us know where you're tuning in from. Please note that this conversation is being recorded. You should have received a notification um, and that will be archived on our YouTube channel. We ask that you keep your microphones muted for the duration of the event and closed captions are available by clicking the live transcription button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Thank you so much for joining us today for the third installment of this year's History of Art Conversation series, Radical Legacies in Contemporary Creative Work, curated by Shawnee Peters and Joseph Couillé, founders of The Black School. The Black School, founded in 2016, is an experimental art school teaching Black and POC students and allies to become agents of change through arts workshops on radical Black politics and public interventions that address local community needs, now based in New Orleans. Today's intergenerational conversation is between the illustrious Layla Ann Marie Stevens, Elliot Jerome Brown Jr. and El Kasimu Harris on photography, self-determination and the archive. And don't forget to use the hashtag Radical Legacies on Instagram and Twitter to continue the conversation. This program is supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with City Council, as well as the support from our vibrant community. While a donation today is not expected or necessary, it's certainly appreciated. We also hope that you'll join us next week for the last installment of the series on healing ancestors and self-care as arts workers. So now I will turn it over to Shawnee and Joseph to introduce today's speakers. Thank you, Devin. Thank you everybody for joining us here today. Um, happy to see everybody on the call, especially our speakers. Really excited for today's talk. Um, I'm Shawnee Peters. This is Joseph Kouye. <laughs> Um, we are coming to you from what is present day New Orleans, originally occupied by the Chittimacha, the Apacata, uh, I said that wrong, Ap yeah, Apacata, Chata, Huma, Natchez, and Tunica people, also known as Bobancha, a uh, land of many languages, and I'm taking inspiration from one of last week's panelists, uh, historian and much more, Shana M. Griffin, I will add um, that what is presently known as New Orleans is also built upon the blood and the forced labor of African, captive, African captives um, and their many descendants. Um, so yeah, we, we just wanna honor um, where we are, very happy to be here. As Devin mentioned, um, uh, we've recently relocated from New York and we're excited to be able to have these conversations that help to pull together these communities that we have around the country as we really root ourselves um, here in this work um, in New Orleans. So Joe's gonna share some intro remarks, um, then we'll share bios, and we'll hear from our speakers, um, sort of individual uh, introductions, and we'll all talk together. We invite you all to think of questions throughout, drop them in the chat. Um, we'll for sure get to questions towards the end and maybe in between, you know, if and when that makes sense. Yeah, but don't wait until the end to uh, put your questions in the chat. Um, you can do it throughout the talk. Yeah. So the camera is the most efficient and effective tool we have for self-documentation. The artists we have assembled before you today represent multiple generations of photographers documenting Black culture for the archive so that when future generations look back, they can know we were here and there's nothing we didn't do to engender love, joy, power, and freedom in our time here. Kasimu, Elliot, and Layla are what you would call keepers of the image as Kwame Brathwaite, Brathwaite. Brathwaite put, in his, put in the preface of his monograph, Black is Beautiful. Like the, 19, like the 1960s when Breath what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> was documenting the cultural and political movements surrounding him, we too are in the midst of a historical time. Today, 
image keepers take on a new role in a world where everyone has a camera in their pocket and the photographic image has become more disposable. How will we keep the history we create every day alive through documentation, presentation, and circulation? How can we speak to future generations so to tell them they already have everything they need, it is inside them, as our ancestors spoke to us before? In today's discussion, we will attempt to answer these questions and many more. But before we get started, allow me to thank today's panelists, El Kasimu Harris, Elliot Jerome Brown Jr., and Layla Ann Marie Stevens. Now Shani is going to read each panelist's bio, then we'll start to talk with five minute intros from each artist. Okay. El Kasimu Harris is a New Orleans based artist whose practice deposits a number of different strategic and conceptual devices in order to push narratives. He strives to tell stories of underrepresented communities in New Orleans and beyond. Harris has shown in numerous group exhibitions across the US and in two international exhibitions and has five solo photography exhibitions. 2018, his War on Be Knighted series was part of a changing course reflections on New Orleans histories group exhibition in New or at the New Orleans Museum of Art. His writing and photographs were featured in A Shot Before Last Call, capturing New Orleans vanishing black bars. That was published in the New York Times. Harris's essay, The Dismantling of Southern Photography was recently published in the Ogden Museum of Southern Arts catalog, New Southern Photography. Harris has images in several publications, including Dandelion, The Black Dandy and Street Style by Chantrell P. Lewis by Aperture. Shout out Chantrell. Currently, Harris works in, uh, Harris's work is included in State of the Art 2020 at Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art and has a solo exhibition, Vanishing Black Bars and Lounges, photographs by El Casimo Harris at the August Wilson African American Cultural Center in Pittsburgh. Harris was a 2018 artist and resident at the Center for Photography at Woodstock and is currently a 2020 Joan Mitchell Center um, artist in resident. He earned a B BBA in entrepreneurship from Middle Tennessee State University and an MA in journalism from the University of Mississippi. Elliot Jerome Brown Jr., born 1993 in Baldwin, New York, contemplates the use of discretion in photography. He lives and works in Queens, New York. In addition to various group and solo exhibitions, he has completed residencies at Abrams Art Center in New York, St. Rock Community Church in New Orleans, and Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture in Maine. He was a recipient of the 2019 Rima Hortman Foundation Emerging Artist Grant. Brown received his BFA in photography from the Tisch School of Arts at the NYU New York University. Finally, Layla Ann Marie Stevens, born 2001, is a photographer and visual artist from South Jamaica, Queens, New York. Her work focuses on portraiture through, blood, uh, through bold documentation and storytelling, particularly on youth members of marginalized communities as it relates to identity and the creation of a safe space. That's Layla's official photographer bio. I will add that she has been an active participant in the Sadie Nash Leadership Project, is a member of the talent agency Scope of Work and is an alumni, former design apprentice and current social media and communications associate for the Black School. We stand young Layla and each of today's panelists and are really excited to hear you all uh, speak. Um, with that, Kasim, I'd like to pass it off to you. Hey everyone, how's it going? Um, <laughs> I don't want to say intergenerational. I, I kept looking at everyone's pictures. I was like, well, who's the older person? And then after I heard I read the, the bios, I, I'm the older person. <laughs> so um, I think I can share my screen and I'll do that, get it right into some work. Um, I'm right there with you, Kasima, don't feel bad. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay. It's a, I would say this is an apropos transition uh, and hearing uh, the people paying homage to the uh, Native American people who inhibited this earth and this land well before we did. In New Orleans, we have a tradition of uh, black masking Indians who uh, paid homage 
to the native people. And uh, it's a, uh, you have uptown and downtown, and it's a series of sewing your suits together, very intricate, beautiful patterns. This is St. Joseph's Night, uh, and this is uh, Big Chief Bo Dallas. So my work is really based in telling things as it is, uh, like the truth, you know, just plainly, basically. You know, I try to do it from a perspective that you might not see. Uh, some of these things, as you can see, look through the edges of the frame. It's a lot of photographers there. So you always try to think of what's a different way to show an image. So sometimes it's just backing up. Uh, this right here is uh, the same big chief we just saw, uh, Daryl Montana. This was going to be his last Mardi Gras. So he was retiring after uh, suiting, wearing a suit for maybe 45 years. So a little backstory, we have the Black Masking Indians. Typically, they come out around Carnival time, or Carnival Day, and the lead up to that suit process is a year, and you have tribes of Indians, which consist of several different positions, like a flag boy, a spy boy, and then the big chief, who's the obviously the, the states person of the, the group. So uh, that's him processing to another place. So we they meander through these neighborhoods in New Orleans. They don't have a parade route like you would have Zulu or Rex or something like that. And it's a, comes from a tradition of when you couldn't participate in Mardi Gras, you celebrated yourself in your own communication, in your own neighborhood or community. So self-determination this way. Then we have the Black Men of Labor. Uh, this stems from the benevolent societies when you couldn't get insurance. So you join a benevolent society a group that you could buy in and they would ensure a proper burial. So these black spaces, uh, these groups have existed since the, the late 1800s. And uh, this group isn't as old, but they really uh, are caretakers of that traditional brass band sound you hear in New Orleans. When I say that, think about Louis Armstrong, that type of music, King Oliver things like that. So uh, this day, it wasn't a jazz funeral, but it was a celebration about 42 weeks a year. These black groups, social aid and pleasure clubs parade through the city. And it's also another opportunity to celebrate yourself within a community. If you are a day laborer, uh, oyster shucker, uh, and typically uh, these unseen positions, this is the opportunity that you get to get celebrated. This is St. Joseph night again in this photo. Uh, this is Uptown New Orleans. And one of the things I'm thinking about in this photo is the displacement of culture, as well as the gentrification of these neighborhoods. Uh, so I really wanted to show the people coming outside their home at night uh, because this neighborhood is rapidly changing. This neighborhood is about two blocks away from St. Charles Avenue, the picturesque uh, mansions with the old desire streetcar that runs not desire but the streetcar that runs so uh it's very uh highly desirable property uh, so shifting that totally shifting gears here another part of my practice is uh constructing reality so everything's based in truth and i'm just staging these narratives this was the warner of a nice series uh and staging the truth of kids being frustrated with education and taking uh, matters into their own hands and having this nonviolent coup d'etat. This image right here is called The Struggle Before School. I'm thinking about uh, the demise of neighborhood schools in New Orleans and the busing, the history of busing from um, minority majority communities. And uh, here, the busing that they don't have neighborhood schools anymore and kids are often getting up before daylight to get to school. So that's that's what's going on there. This is race to the top, just poking a hole at this uh, whole kind of thing that we often hear, no child left behind, war on drugs, war on poverty. Uh, it's like who shows up for students in academics and uh, oftentimes academics and athletics are the only way that you can get out of the neighborhood. Uh, then going back into, uh, telling it like it is. This is some work from the uh, Black Bar series, Vashley Black Bars and Lounges. Again, most of my work is driven by being upset about something. 
something around me. So I, I started to notice here in New Orleans, a lot of the black bars were turning white. And it was a total erasure of the institutional history uh, that existed there. So that's what's going on. You know, some of this is influenced by Roy DeCarava, but then also Bernie Imes who did Juke Joints uh, in Mississippi. But you see, if once this bar is sold, all of this comes down, you know? And then lastly, we go back into, uh, I guess, combining these two things, the truth telling as it is, and then staging something. So this is from a Fox Rich project. Uh, I work with uh, Fox Rich, who was in the film recently, Time, that Garrett Bradley did. Uh, so this was a little bit before that. And uh, so, you know, I got a chance to interview Fox and it helped me visualize things that she was saying. I'll skip to one that's much shorter. All right. So this is Fox Rich. This, the name of this is The Gift of Freedom and Justice. And she was incarcerated and she uh, went to our OBGYN appointment. And uh, she said there she was with the, the doctor and two armed guards. So, uh, you know, she prays to herself, Lord, please don't let me have my baby like this. And in the photo, you know, I decided to scale back instead of recreating all that stuff, just how she would feel on the inside, her internal emotions, and just that aloneness and uh, just, you know, kind of like that, that, that trinity. You see her, you see a shadow, and then you see a reflection, that three. So yeah, uh, it ended with this, uh, this reimagining of her life once her husband was released from prison. So there we are. And these are direct quotes. So it was showed with direct quotes and these visual ideas I had. And I think that was five or seven minutes. I don't know. It <laughs> was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Elliot, can you share with us, please? Sure, yes. Uh, thank you for that. Um, Wait, how would you like us to refer to you? Oh, Cosimo or just Cosimo? Cosimo is cool. Cosimo, okay. Cool. Well, thank you for, um, for sharing your work and thank you, uh, Shana and Joe and CBA, for having me here to share alongside you all. Um, so I'm Can you speak to... up, Elliot? Uh, I think it actually might be these headphones. I'm going to take the headphones off. <clears throat> Is this, is this better? Okay. <clears throat> um, all right, so I'm gonna share um, some work. One second. Okay. All right, so I wanted to start here with this project, which is usually a series that I kind of uh, keep private <laughs> um, as it was the first series that I made yeah, first series of work that I made um, during my freshman year of undergrad at NYU. And it was a project uh, titled The Ramble, um, in which uh, I had been introduced to The Ramble by two professors who kind of mentioned it casually in these really salacious ways. Um, one had kind of mentioned like kind of meandering through this part of the park um, in Central Park this very densely forested area with uh, his son and kind of like diverting his child's eyes away from like condoms on the floor, like the remnants of like sexual activity, needles, et cetera. Um, and then another person had kind of, another professor had kind of reiterated uh, that experience. And I was like, ooh, what's, what's going on in that park? Like, <laughs> like you know, I wanna, I wanna know what that is. So um, I specifically wanted to know what it was uh, at the time because I was interested in exploring my sexuality, um, where as prior to that, it was a bit dormant. Uh, so I went into the ramble, uh, both to experience it as a participant, but as well to eventually make photographs of the space. Um, and, you know, in wanting to make work in this space, I wanted to still preserve the anonymity um, that's so integral to its use. Um, as most people who uh, cruise for sex are doing so um, with anonymously um, and throughout different 
times in folks' lives, but certainly throughout different moments within history, that anonymity is more or less important. Um, so, you know, cruising is a direct reflection of, um, of various phobias that exist around people's um, sexual identity, but as well folks' racial identities. Uh, this is often a place where I see a lot of Black people seeking um, sexual relationships or some sort of intimacy um, with one another. So I wanted to work with this place in a way that still preserved that, um, yeah, that still preserved that characteristic of the space. So uh, I began working with the space as a kind of pseudo um, documentary. So my goal was to kind of like find someone within the space that would be able to help me facilitate um, a narrative of some sort. So what follows is made up and um, that has become, fiction has become like a pretty integral part of the way that I practice photography. And again, I'd like to start here with this work because of how um, fiction was used as a tool, but not necessarily because I wanted to, but because um, this, was, this was the best way that I saw fit to respect um, the goings on within this space. So as a result, we're getting things where I'm like kind of pulled back, um, pulled back from uh, people's views. So you don't see people too clearly unless they consent to be viewed um, in a particular way. And as a result of being pulled back, you're getting a lot more of the environment than you are um, any one person. Um, and I'll, yeah, I'll kind of share a little bit more about that later. Um, so again, the kind of tools that um, emerged during this time of uh, placing folks at a distance from the lens, using blur, you, uh, having folks' backs turned to the camera as ways to, again, protect uh, folks' anonymity, but still tell a story of a sort. Um, those tools have continued to stay, um, yeah, have continued to stay with me in my photographic work. Uh, so this figure that we see here was the person that agreed to be a part of the project. I literally jumped at the first person that said yes. I maybe went through about eight different people in the park like, hey, I'm doing this project. <laughs> like, you know, wanted to be explicit about it because people were there looking for sex. And I didn't want to um, have sex while I was doing this work. So I, um, <laughs> I wanted to be clear from the jump. I'm doing a project. I, go, but I want to take photos. <laughs> um, so this person was very excited about the prospect of making images with me um, and also kind of crafting the story alongside me, but nonetheless also wanted to be protected within the image. So we often see this person kind of like tucked away in the margins of their things, similar to how, uh, you know, these individuals are presented here. <clears throat> um, and then following this project, and you know, this is kind of the culminating image within this project, uh, which consists of about 24 uh, black and white film images. And I began to um, make self portraits more consistently. So most of those portraits, um, sorry, most of those portraits were me wanting to kind of like entangle myself within others is uh, bodies as a way to kind of see myself, uh, kind of stretch what I perceive to be the limits of myself um, and to just have some kind of physical manifestation of that desire to um, be expansive. Um, but then as well, <clears throat> the self-portraits were a place for me to like quite literally perform myself and what I felt was a hurt or a kind of shame, um, etc. So um, a lot of the time I was, you know, renting um, environments to kind of <laughs> like indicate some kind of, yeah, some kind of um, sexuality, um, but to as well discuss a kind of melancholy around um, that. And then following having made those images like consistently for about a year, um, I found that particularly in school that the response that I was getting was uh, a bit invasive. And I don't lodge that as a criticism of folks's um, interest in the work, um, but more that I still wanted to operate with a degree of discretion about the things that I was, um, you know, dealing with. And I didn't necessarily want to have to share um, my interiority with strangers, more or less. Um, 
So I wanted to devise a way to continue to work with the body, continue to work with representation, um, and to think about the tension between agony and pleasure, um, and you know the various states of human uh, of, of human feeling and behavior without um, it being attached to any one person's identity. And this image, what became critical in that effort. Um, so it's a, another, it's a self-portrait of me, but just with my face removed. But for me, it allowed, um, in removing the face, it allowed for the image to kind of be recontextualized to various ends and to maybe kind of be about a spectrum of things as opposed to any one thing. So that kind of leads me into the work that I make now. And I think I'm maybe coming up on five to seven minutes. I'm going to maybe speed through this a bit. But this is a part of an installation that I have up right now at the New Orleans Museum of Art. Um, uh, it's a group show of four artists, uh, one of which includes me. And these works that we see here are a series of redacted portraits, um, which are, were made by um, making screen prints directly onto the museum. Uh, the surface of the museum's wall. So what we get um, as a result is these kind of shadows or latent images uh, that seem to be calling from beyond the wall um, or that maybe you don't even recognize at first glance, especially when paired next to something like what we see here on the left, which is this more traditionally presented image. So a lot of the work that I do is about how, um, you know, one, how can I use um, or how rather, how can I work with uh, the people that I share intimacy with in some fictionalized capacity to arrive at something that feels expansive and malleable. But as well, um, I'm really interested in how we work with things that are not tangible, how we work with things that are not um, immediately available or knowable. Um, and I'm, you know, kind of playing with photography as a, um, you know, as a medium that is can be rooted in reality, but how, um, but playing with its ability to actually communicate the fullness of the thing, um, and yeah, being kind of direct about that. So these are those works. This is some more stuff. Um, I think I'm gonna stop here. <clears throat> Thank you so much. I want to see all the full presentations, but we'll get there. Um, Layla, please share. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm just going to share my application. Um, thank you so much, Elliot, for your presentation of work. Um, OK. So I wanted to start off this conversation by um, thinking about the family album and how that kind of directs uh, our form of legacies um, in a direct way of memory using the photographs. Um, and so my grandmother has always been someone that had a disposable camera around um, and this is something that I return to quite often, thinking about how far back I really thought um, about using the lens as a tool of expression. Um, and so thinking about family um, and the closeness of my community, um, I am the youngest of five girls. And so my whole family is surrounded by these women, these young black women. Um, all of my sisters have all girls. I have no sons at all within my family. And so uh, it was such a prominent part of who I had become was becoming um, a really strong young woman um, and how to really build that. And so watching my niece grow up um, and having my sister teach her all of these ways to be um, a young girl is really, really such a beautiful and integral part of uh, who I am. And that's most importantly why this photograph is something that I hold really dear um, and near to my heart and something that I always uh, 
begin starting off my work with. Um, and so going into high school, I had not a huge sense of community within girls that I could really relate to. And that was a lot of um, keeping to myself, but also using the camera uh, as my sense of uh, community. That was something that I held really close um, because I didn't really necessarily have friends that I uh, could relate to. And so I joined the yearbook um, committee and I was watching these young girls um, who are sisters um, and they're twins. And uh, this is a photograph from Twin Day where they were uh, paired up together. And I, I just think that there is such beauty in the way that they are freely expressing themselves. They are freely being themselves without apology, without um, being scared, without uh, any fear of uh, who they might be perceived as. Um, and that's something that is really rare, I think, um, with the addition of social media and additional perceptions. Um, and so I wanna kind of navigate into this conversation about community uh, organizations and community um, programs that are focused on youth uh, as so much as the Black school is. Um, I found myself at the Black School at a program called City National Leadership Project, which is for young women um, who are based in activism. And so these are two young girls who have participated in that program who I grew fond with um, being strong, being uh, capable of just leaning on someone else that you could relate to is something that is very strong. Um, and integrating into uh, kind of realizing that, ooh, I'm sorry about that motorcycle. Um, into the sense of identity, um, I've started to kind of navigate being not just comfortable finding friends, but also being comfortable with myself and an observation of that I started to talk to these young women who identified as queer as me. And young Maya, um, she is in South Jamaica, Queens, and she was telling me about the sense of lostness that she feels in her home and this uh, contrast between these youth programs that she used to participate in and uh, the fear that she feels at home being persecuted for being queer, but um, also having this dominating religion um, above her. And so I, I tried to integrate that um, visually. Thinking about queer folks as well. Um, these are two young women I know personally who uh, have been through a lot um, and thinking about freedom and just really what love is, what love envisions to be also a part of uh, this queer series called House is Not a Home. Um, young Kenya is in Queens as well. Uh, I tried to integrate both writing with uh, my portraiture work and really have freedom of using documentation physically as a way to um, archive both of these mediums in a in a really beautiful format. Uh, something I, I really try to do is allow these folks to feel comfortable expressing their body language in a way that is the most human. Um, so you might feel a sense of awkwardness or a sense of tension between these folks and the camera. But I think that that is something that is uh, so emotionally uh, driven that I often feel it's most beautiful uh, rather than something that is staged. Keeping with the idea of intimacy, um, self-reflection and identity, uh, I started to navigate into this idea of a more contemporary uh, portraiture 
um, but still with the idea of reflection. And so this is a little bit about black beauty, black confidence. And so for the Magnum Foundation, um, I want to grant uh, in pursuit of uh, documenting these young people and their hopes of the future. Um, and this young woman here is a leader of N N NFT photography. Um, and I just am thinking about uh, these women and um, our gardens and um, my grandmother's garden that I used to be photographed in and how can I shed her in that light as well. And to return it back to um, youth, uh, I think about uh, this photograph that I recently took of this black woman photographer um, and her daughter. And I think that there is such beauty in uh, their intimacy, their closeness, and this bond that exists between family um, that hopefully will exist within their family albums um, one day. So beautiful. Uh, it's been like a real pleasure to get to know each of your practices a bit more through through just preparing for this talk and then seeing seeing these presentations. Um, so yeah, and we really also would love to to hear hear how your practices intersect with one another. So before we get into any questions, I want to open it up. If, if any of you all want to start off the conversation, um, Layla, Elliot, or Kasima with a question um, for one another, um, go for it. Otherwise, we've got some things. Yeah, I guess mine is more of a common. Um, I have a few thoughts, but I'll start with this first one for you, Layla, since you just finished. Um, I am really drawn to um, work made by queer people that incorporates um, the relationships between parents and children. Um, and I guess, you know, I just so often am, am thinking about the logistics of parenting and how foundational of a, of a relationship that is and the ways in, um, you know, how trauma is sourced at that level. Um, or begins at that level, uh, regardless of you know what other niceties or pleasures you know a, a child is instilled with. Um, so I'm really grateful for the images that you make that um, that show that, especially as they don't necessarily read you know in a queer way. But I think it's possible just knowing your the breadth of your work um, to be able to fantasize about any number of things really um, in relationship to the images based on how you how you contextualize the work. So yeah, like I said, more of a comment than it is a question. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, I feel there is such tenderness at that age that um, is often not documented so much in the sense uh, in a photographic way more so uh, as it is in the family album way, but um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Elliot. I was, I was uh, captivated uh, by each of you all's approach to, I'm assuming here, self-discovery, but also uh, you know, how you all approached it, like one, just one seeming to be a physical and intimate, yours, Elliot, and yours, uh, like like Elliot said, the relationship between the, the parent uh, and the outside world as well. So like, I just really like that it's similar subjects, but really different approaches. So it's not much of a, a comment. But, but the, the one question I did have for you, Elliot, not to take up too much time was, uh, I, when, when you, she asked about through lines between our work. When you started talking about fiction, I thought about that, uh, like, you know, using a something fictional to tell the truth. 
Uh, so I just thought that was cool. And then your work lately is just, I, I love just, uh, just, it's just great. Uh, I, I even thought about Dawood's uh, classroom series, right? Where people are writing letters, you know, talking about how they feel and deal with the portraiture. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, Kasimu, I think you just like put into context like the kind of threads connecting y'all. I see um, Layla's work is very much about self-discovery and not just her own self-discovery, but like self-discovery of like her peers um, and, her, and different folks in her community. And I see your work, Kasimu, as like kind of this documentation of the world around you. Um, and I, there may be self in there, but it, it, it's, it's kind of a step removed. Um, and then I see you doing both, Elliot. Like I see you documenting this world around you that you may or may not feel a part of, but also documenting yourself and, and, and the folks in your, your peer group and your uh, intimate relationships as a way of documenting yourself. So that's interesting. Like, to have like these, these different approaches, um, this spectrum of approaches in, in, in y'all one group. Yeah. Um, Ken, I wanna uh, start off with this question. Um, how do y'all imagine your work informing future generations? Um, and, and whoever wants to pick that up and run with it, go for it. Since you, you're documenting uh, young people, how about you start, Kasimu, if you if you prepare? I mean, y'all all documenting youth yeah. culture, but. Um, you know, okay, th there's this album I like, and it's just a, a phrase that people use all the time, uh, but Crit was here, you know, W-U-Z, Crit was here. You know, I, I think about, you know, people who scribble things on a wall, sometimes I was here, you know, I don't like graffiti like that, but when you think about a statement, uh, you have to boldly declare that you were here. Like without someone telling your story, without you having an image, it's just, we move on so fast. And there's, there could be no record of your existence, you know, for you as a person, but then for you as a community, and then you just can continue to scale that out. So that's a theme that always, goes through my mind. I, I was here when I'm documenting things that are, and when I'm reimagining or imagining things like with the Warner Bonita series, as it relates to future generations, I wonder how much of what I imagine would be their reality at that point. And uh, I'm, I'm not deep into Afrofuturism yet, but I was listening to this Gap Band song the other day and it was, you know, gotta get away from here. And I have been, so it's talking about like the present. The present is, is stressful and you wanna go to another place that you can be free, you know? Uh, so I, I look at my work like that. It's a, it's a hope for the future and it's a, a bold declaration of what's present. I think I was trying to get at that um, in the intro uh, remarks about this, this same idea you're talking about, I was here. I, I remember writing this book of poetry a few years back and I was just doing some research on ritual, which led me to ritual and like black liberation uh, movements. And that led me to Haiti, obviously. But then that uprising led me to the, the constant state of uprising and rebellion that was happening during slavery in America, that is not a story told, you know, it's more often like there's this kind of story about, um, uh, it, it encapsulated by Kanye West's like uh, 300, 400 years of slavery, whatever he said, uh, that sounds like a choice. And that's obviously from ignorance. He's a loud, ignorant person. But a lot of people believe that, like that, that folks weren't fighting. Folks were just like complacent. 
but really like folks are constant in fighting. And a lot of those rebellions were lost, but some were won. Um, and some folks won their freedom through resistance. And I see that resistance in y'all work. And I think it's, it's important for future generations to know that everything that folks are telling us, black people need to do this, black people need to do that. We've done it. We've done everything you can think of already, you know? And we've done it multiple times, you know, over and over. Um, so yeah, I think um, seeing y'all work makes me, me think of like the future generations that are gonna see this work and know that they they aren't the first to go through this and there's there's two and there's paths that already been laid down for them that they can they can follow and move and bring forward into the future. Right. Um, I'll ask the I'll ask the question again for uh, Layla and Elliot. How do they um, how do y'all imagine your work in forming future generations? Yeah, I'll pick that up. Um, first, I think I haven't been able to imagine images that represented um, folks like me uh, within the photography that I've been studying or um, I've been informed about. So I hope that the future generations that might see these images uh, at their age of 18 or 19 or 20 in these um, in between periods between adulthood and uh, childhood, um, that they recognize their self-worth, I think, um, really just examining how important it is to not only share uh, yourself and share uh, what you're worth um, with the people that you trust, um, but also just being able to be free without any uh, hesitation necessarily. Um, yeah. Yeah, I would say that for myself, you know, when I consider the trajectory of the tools that I've used um, within photography and what those tools have been in service of, um, <clears throat> it has allowed me to focus on things that I think get lost in photographs, like, you know, um, you know, I, I, love, I love people, I love looking at people, love looking at people's faces, but I love very much the kind of things that are constructed around them. So the objects that kind of make up this, the environments that they uh, are situated in, or um, yeah, things, things, that, things that tend to not be emphasized within the image and preference of, you know, the who, what, when, where, and why of the photograph. And <clears throat> I think about those objects as a kind of like, um, scaffolding for like contextualizing and understanding an individual um, and as a way to kind of get in the get to the interiority of a person so you know what are the and, and then as well a lot of the work that I make are is, are um, more kind of casual oops maybe lost somebody oh. <laughs> um, they're more like kind of casual happenings um, so you know I'm I'm interested in, in working with representation in a way that um, feels, uh, that just has a little, a, a lot more room around it. And for now that has looked like not being clear about what the photograph is about or um, you know what's being seen here and uh, perhaps being confusing. Um, and I think those are useful tools for young people to have um to not to like you know resist a certain clarity around um yeah to resist clarity in, in whatever way that might 
work for them. Yeah, I th I'm thinking like as you all talking, as you know, you can see um, Gordon Park's photo behind Casimo, right? So this whole series is is really um, informed by legacy, right? And um, the legacies that inform people working in contemporary creative fields across the board. Um, and I'm realizing that the legacy of photography um, has been resisting this thing that I think are collectively the black community is, is really resisting um, now in this generation, um, which is like respectability politics, right? Um, around sexuality, around um, income, right? Around poverty, around resistance, right? Around all these things. And then I'm thinking about um, Gordon Park's photography. It's like, yeah, and he was always showing us all of us, right? He was always reflecting that whole thing. Um, so yeah, I was gonna ask some question about like how in this particular generation, like the significance of particularly Layla and Elliot's practices in, you know, cause we got, we got the, the issues that we deal with from white supremacy. And then we got the issues that we deal with when our, within our own community, right? Mm -hmm. um, and we definitely see this emergence um, in these, within these generations that are in this circle, right? Like when me and Cosimo in, ele in elementary school versus maybe Joe and Elliot closer in age to like, like there's been such, there's been such an opening up around gender and sexuality in these generations. Um, and it's amazing to see, but it's still like so much, so much that we have to, so much pushback that has to be made to, to those elder generations that still really have it locked in, in their minds that it's just, it's not appropriate to be ourselves, right? For people to be ourselves. Um, so I don't know what the question is, but I think, I think I'm just, I'm thinking of you all's practices, um, you two, especially these practices in terms of this like future um, informing, because while we have seen like, um, while we saw poor people reflected in, in Gordon Park's photography and not just necessarily like the best of us or right, it's, it's urged to have only positive representations, only positive, oh, right, yeah. quote unquote, positive representations of black people in former um, generations. Um, in in U2's um, practices, I see this, this opportunity for next generations to really see themselves. Right, um, and, to, and to see all of ourselves, right? It's not even just about queer black people seeing it. It's like all black people seeing all black people. Mm -hmm. just fighting for liberation for all black people. Is it really, is it really all, right? Is that what we're really talking about? Yeah, I think it's a good question to ask, what are the legacies that inform your work? You know, and especially those legacies that kind of made way for you to yeah go your own path and leave that 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 um already well walk well tried path and to do what what you saw was missing or just not privileged in the archive mm -hmm. already mm -hmm. um i would say that you know when i was in undergrad um and you know, learning about photography as a, as a tool to think alongside. Um, I had came a, came a, been introduced to Dina Lawson's work, I think through the MoMA show that she uh, was a part of, the new photography show there. And seeing that work, it kind of like clicked something in my brain where it was like, oh, like, you know, you can, you can, you can kind of, um, she was, she seemed to be making images that were rooted in in um, rooted in honor, but that were also rooted in dignity, and used the natural body language of those individuals to kind of communicate those things, as opposed to referencing, um, uh, yeah, like referencing like other ways of visualizing visualizing dignity. Um, so like we're looking at, you know, very ornate homes, we're looking at very uh, complex homes, very messy homes. Um, and we're looking at people kind of organize themselves in um, 
ways that necessarily don't have much to do with ideal. And I was like, oh, wow. Yeah, people should be able to be seen like within the gamut of expression. Um, and I, you know, presenting yourself in the most ideal way is just one way of, of, of uh, being a part of an image. Um, so, you know, following having seen that, I knew that I was interested in working with people across a spectrum of expression and that it wasn't limited to any, it didn't, it wasn't limited to, and it didn't privilege any one particular expression. I kind of wanted to be able to see anything. So, you know, when I am working with people, I often am arriving to them with very little direction. Um, and usually the direction is, you know, to kind of carry on as though, you know, this may have been, uh, to, yeah, to carry on as though you would have just been, you know, going about your day in any case, um, because I want to be able to uh, develop new references to and that are, you know, rooted in an in individual person's subjectivity, and not so much like, you know, who you could be based on what, like, you know, what you're seeing out elsewhere in the world. Um, so I would say that that uh, is a is a contemporary legacy that I feel adjacent to, um, and I'm happy to contribute information alongside. Definitely see that relationship, hundred percent. And and I think um, you bringing out the ideal is like interesting to think of like um, different types of ideals because you know I think thinking of uh, Loss's work and and this documentation of the people she documents. Um, it reminds me of like kind of subculture photography and, and folks that like are immersed in the subculture and you see like totally different types of ideal that kind of complicate the, the fine art uh, ideal or the, the fashion and celebrity culture ideal. You know, you see people who clearly care deeply about their self presentation, but their self presentation doesn't look like anything that's like on the popular stage, you know, which is is interesting. It complicates the narrative in a way that's like more truthful of the time, you know, mm -hmm. and especially of like the cultures, the, the communities I come from, because like the people in those photographs, you know, they represent more of my family than say like a you know a, a vogue or a essence magazine mm -hmm. in the way they present themselves and the way they want to present themselves. Mm -hmm. um Casimo and Layla y'all want to talk about legacies I think you're muted yeah you're on mute I keep muting myself. Um, can you tell me a little bit about the question again? I heard his answer, but my internet was going a little bit in and out about the, the legacy part. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. And the only reason we keep going on mute is because we have a four-year-old in the house and she might run out anytime. But <laughs> the, uh, the question is what legacies inform your work? Um, whew, man. I, I don't, ooh. I mean, there's obviously folk, photographers I look at a lot. Uh, and I think sometimes uh, Kenneth, Kenneth Montague, one time, he looked at a photo that I took of um, Malcolm and Marissa Drink Jenkins, the photo, one of the photos that was in the dandelion. And he told me intentionally or unintentionally, my photo was referencing uh, James Van Der Zee's couple in the raccoon coat. And I was like, man, you know, I don't know if I've ever seen that photo before, but I understood what he was saying. So like most people, you know, I'm reading all the time. I'm looking at photos all the time. I don't always know how it directly comes out in my work. That image behind me, I, I did, I was inspired by that once with Malcolm Jenkins again and him in front of an American flag and just thinking about uh, being all tied up. He had a bow tie line at the time, but that and the history of lynching in our country. 
Uh, you know, I like Adabu Bay a lot, uh, Carrie Mae Means, and uh, just, you know, I grew up in journalism. So a lot of stuff that I looked at was that kind of stuff for a, year, a number of years, and probably until about 2012, when I really started to look more and more at fine art. Uh, but it's a lot of work that I like out there. And I love looking at things on Instagram to see what's going on now. And uh, I love looking at a lot of things that's not photography. Uh, so I don't know if that answers the question, but that's some of the things that I think about. Uh, I'm just constantly trying to consume images. You know, uh, did I answer the question? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I definitely want to talk about um, social media more. Um, so maybe, maybe that can be the next topic we get into after Layla yeah. talks about legacies, which I know she's been sharing research on uh, via, via Black School social media page. Some amazing images this week and always. Yeah. Um, I mean, first putting in the work to actually research and um, look up these folks who don't necessarily make it to our tech. Can y'all hear us? Is it us or is it like Wi-Fi? Mm, I can hear you. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, we could come back to that. Um, but yeah, you know the 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 space that social media takes up in our lives these days, especially Instagram um, being a photography based medium. Um, it definitely like I don't know. It adds to or it complicates um this this reality of, of photography being um a literal space for documentation right it's literal reflective archive of of all the times um so yeah and it's weird for all of us i think to kind of live these lives on social media and not but especially as photographers um what do you all make of of this era we're living in how how do you how do you register your practice, right? Your art photography with the pictures that end up on your on your Instagram page, right? How does that feel for you all? I will say that something that I was thinking about yesterday, so that you know, this this comment is actually not so much related to my work, but more just about the phenomena of uh, you know, having access to the tools to document yourself um, is that, you know, people who are growing up right now, um, which um, I'm certainly the result, the result of, of our experiences within my generation as well. I'm only, I'm only 27. Uh, but <clears throat> I, I find it really fascinating that, you know, perhaps your family may not have been, um, didn't, consider it their responsibility to document, you know, things growing up, or maybe the things that they were documenting had absolutely nothing to do about your personal experience of this world, but you know, how your thoughts were developing, um, how your mind was developing, what your relationships were like to your friends, what your relationships were like to your desire. Like, you know, my mom wasn't making photographs of me, like, sharing lollipops with people who I thought were cute, like, <laughs> like, in uh in elementary school but like kids who have phones in elementary schools these days can do have access to to doing that and i think um you know that like um like the immediacy of cameras and the prevalence of cameras now make it so that um you can begin to uh complicate the archive a bit so that it again it isn't relegated completely to celebration like the celebration of like say you're an achievement moving from one grade to the next or the first day of school or a barbecue like it can make space for i hate this bitch i don't like this person like photographs can include that or you know i really love myself uh when my hair looks like this and you know my skin looks really great this day it can be as minute 
um, and, and seemingly inconsequential as possible and to kind of have that breadth of work <laughs> or that br the, uh, the, that breadth those that breadth of documents um, over time I think is really fascinating um, so I'm you know yeah just to com to comment on the the tool of social media a bit as far as it relates to my work, it's just a place for me to share. <laughs> it's a place for me for me to let y'all know that I'm alive and I'm doing I'm doing some things. <clears throat> let's let's put a pin in, in in the social media conversation. Uh, we can come right back to it, but I want to uh, make space for later to finish your thoughts on uh, legacy and and research and all those things. Yeah, sorry about that. I, I'm back. <laughs> um, I spoke a little bit about uh, Dawood Bey, um, who actually went to the same high school as I did back in the 70s, I think. And I didn't figure that out until a year and a half ago, um, because again, of my own research. And I think that is something else to be said, because his work is so uh, prominent and relevant to people my age. And I think that's something that should be shared and taught to us um, in our photography classes and not um, these certain narratives that are pushed about people who are very far away from us or far away from um, people that look like us within our family. Um, I, was, I was just gonna mention about that, but I think to connect it back to that idea of social media, um, I'm mostly just inspired by the folks who are just taking selfies with their friends or like in the parties in the backyard with their girlfriends. Like that is something so monumental and something so beautiful about that connection that you share with somebody else. Um, and that relationship is something that is worthy of being photographed and um, living on its own, yeah. As far as for me sharing my work on social media, um, it's been a pleasure just having people appreciate and see uh, the work that I'm creating and connecting with new folks because that's apparently um, something that I love to do the most. I remember the first time I heard about Instagram, a writer I know named Brenton Mock, he said that man, there's this thing called Instagram and they can make me look like a photographer like you. And I was like, well, why would anyone want to do that? And I just thought it was stupid as hell and I didn't like it, but I'm on it. <laughs> I'm on it now. Um, and you know, I, like Elliot was saying and Layla was saying, I, I think it's a great archive of what's going on now. And sometimes you think about what's real, what's not. But if you think back, even to uh, like a James Van Der Zee, when people went to pose, uh, take their portraits, that wasn't, from what I've read, that wasn't always their clothes. Uh, and like you see, and uh, if I pronounce his name wrong, forgive me, like Malik Sidibe, you see some of his work, you see some of the same people maybe wearing like the glasses or, you know, I've been a teenager and I used to, my nephew and I borrow the same pair of Jordans. So you, you know, uh, <laughs> What's real could be relative, uh, um, but I do like that for whatever it is you seek, you can find on social media. I, I really do like that. Typically, I, I just share work that I'm doing. And sometimes I think about, uh, well, maybe I'm sharing this too much or maybe I'm not sharing that enough. Uh, and I do know as a working journalist, editors look at your, they look at it, they look at it even for references for another story. Like, I want you to shoot a portrait like this, but not as tight and, and things like that. So uh, that's just kind of interesting, but I, I do like it. And I think it's, I think it's, uh, it has its place. Um, has, has social media and the proliferation of photography on these platforms um change your practice in any way for for example i'm not a photographer but i think social media and like the crispness 
like of the camera and how it's like just getting better and better. And also like the, 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 the filters made me want to buy a film camera and like learn how to use it and um, just bring kind of like the, the hand uh, back into the work, you know, and the imperfection back into like just the work of taking images. Have, have whether it's like um, technological or just like subject matter, has, has social media like kind of made you walk in a different direction in any kind of way? For me, no, in one aspect, but in another aspect, yes, in that, uh, you know, when I'm looking for inspiration, uh, like I, I don't shoot fashion much anymore, but like thinking about portraiture, just different ways to tell the story visually of uh, someone sharing themselves with the general public. How was a different way to tell that story? Just like one would look at movies to figure out different narratives. You start at the end and work to the beginning and, you know, where, where, where's the, the apex? Where's the confrontation? I look at, that's how it's changed the game for me. Being able to like look at, uh, you know, so many young people really, and some of the people that Beyonce keeps using or has used as photographers, like just to see their approach to portraiture, uh, I really like that. Uh, and then lastly, like always how to best uh, show a black woman or a woman period, you know? Uh, you learn a lot from me from looking at that. Yeah, I think um, to kind of relate to um, what Tessimu was saying, I think uh, learning from all these different um, ages of folks who are kind of rising and um, shining themselves on social media has definitely been an influence, uh, me included, because I, I am a part of them. Um, I think social media has created a sort of immediacy that I started to shy away from. And that's partially why I transitioned from using digital to film, because I kind of wanted to take the time to actually learn what I was doing and actually study uh, the mechanics of the cameras that I was using in comparison to the rise of um, these $5,000 cameras that were also inaccessible to me. Um, and there's also something so much more intimate and beautiful um, through actually producing the image, the images physically in comparison to something that is um, um, through the, the phone landscape. Um, there is beauty in that, but I also think um, really learning uh, the, the technical aspects of uh, film camera is something that is, is uh, worthwhile. Um, and to actually take your time to not be uh, so determined on rushing it out and putting it out to the public because you feel a, a pressure to want to um, show like you're constantly producing work when it takes time and it, there's more beauty and focusing on what the narrative is you're trying to shape. Yeah, I would say that Instagram, in addition to, you know, provide like being a source of inspiration from myriad uh, avenues. Um, Instagram has reminded me of the importance of having like a physical um, relationship with images. Um, so a lot of the work that like, you know, when I'm offered opportunities to um, display the work, I'm interested in making a structure of uh, to house the photograph. Um, so in addition to the tactility of prints, um, I'm interested in like achieving some kind of dimension, like three dimensionality with the image itself um, and how that contributes to the experience of the photograph. Um, you know, yeah, they're just <laughs> my screen there. I have so many screenshots um, that mostly come from Instagram and I've done, I've had uh, several ways of kind of 
working with those screenshots um, and like just kind of reflecting on them further. Um, some of that has looked like literally printing them out to kind of sit with them a little longer and use them, use the backs of them uh, to kind of journal a bit about what what's happening there. So yeah, I would say that the influence on my practice has been to um, call to the need to be physical as well as digital. Thank you all. Um, there's a question in the chat that, that kind of reminds me of something I've been thinking about throughout this conversation, um, which is, um, the, the question is, uh, is have you all used um, photography or, let me see, have you all done any work with putting cameras in the hands of young people um, um, that, you that you photograph as well? Which makes me think of just like, teaching art, right, being educators, um, and like the role of, the role that art play, can play in like your personal development in general, right? Like I've always seen, see myself in Layla. Layla somebody who's like very quiet and, you know, kind of to herself, uh, introverted. Um, but her passion for art pushes her out of that when she needs to come out of that. Right, like she wouldn't even been in our, the first program that, that we met her through, she wouldn't have been in. Um, she came up to us and said, I heard you guys are doing this thing. Can, is there space for me, you know? Um, and not like that, that uh, loud and wrong Kanye personality. <laughs> like somebody that will come out of their shell for this thing, you know? And then listening to Layla talk today, the word freedom is coming up so much um, in the way you talk about um, the photographs that you take and the, 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 the characteristics that you see in people, right? So um, so having this, this device in between you can help to kind of like bridge space, right? Can bridge space of, of different personality types of, of, of different comfortability, you know, in the world as a black person, as a, as a woman, as whatever, right? Um, art gives us this opportunity to um, put something in between that, that helps to bring the things back closer. Um, so yeah, so, and we're always working with photographers with the Black School in our work. Neither one of us are quote unquote photographers, but we wouldn't, so much of my work wouldn't exist without pre-existing photographs, right? So photography especially um, holds this, this really big place um, in arts in general. So I'm rambling. Um, <laughs> can we go to, to that question about, um, when and where you all have, have actually put the, the camera in the hands of, um, of people you're photographing. Uh, well, yeah, I've, I've also been a teacher uh, for several years, um, working primarily with high school students um, in various teaching assisting capacities, to be more specific, um, through the International Center of Photography in New York, and as well as NYU's Future Image Makers program. Um, and so, you know, I haven't directly placed the camera in their hands, but I have facilitated their learning around, um, around image making. And what I love particularly about teaching high school students is that um, specifically of, of this generation of high school students is that their political concerns are very uh, sharp and that often there's a lot of space for those concerns to develop alongside their visual language. So what I understand my role to be as a teacher is to kind of um, help them be clear in um, about what it is that they are doing. So like, you know, you can make any, you know, you can make an image in any way you see fit to. You can turn it any color. Um, you, like all of the images can be blurry, they can be motion blur, all the things that people tell you uh, are, you know, wrong about a photograph. You can do it, but let's understand what it's in the service of. Was this an, was this an intentional choice? Um, and what's, you know, it's nice to kind of work with people at that age um, who are really receptive to that language um, because they're, uh, oftentimes they're working with um, less fear than what my experience was uh, of my peers in college and also what my experience was in my own practice within image making, um, thinking that phot photographs needed to kind of appear a particular way or make use of 
uh, certain tools. Um, but I think that's what is really lovely about art in general. I was going to say it's limited to photography, but um, you know, it can, it can look really, literally look like anything. Um, and there are so many practitioners within this medium that um, and that operate, um, yeah, that operate differently from one another. Um, <clears throat> Like a popular example that I like to use in the class is like someone like Leslie Hewitt. Um, like looking at her work, you're not, it's not really going to jump out at you what the hell is going on there. Like it actually, it does take, um, it does take research um, and it does, it takes research, but I think it also can justify to students uh, that the image does not need to look a particular way to meet a certain need. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. The answer is yes. <laughs> I taught full time for two years. And one year I was working with maybe first graders to eighth graders uh, with a, a journalism class. And as recently as last year, I, I taught high school students who had gone through, it was a school for students who have experienced extreme trauma. And uh, the through line between the young, the, the babies and the high school students is I'm always trying to encourage people to tell stories. And uh, especially for high school students to realize that things that are happening in their lives now are likely to become uh, movements. And you know, I often show them like Jamil Shabazz's work as, as a way to be aware of what's going on and to really lean in and, and document that. And, you know, I understand everyone has different personalities. I often tell people going back to archiving to start telling stories of people in your home or in your community, take portraits, you know, I, then I show Latoya Ruby Frazier's work to take portraits and really document and get grandma to talk about, you know, how life was, you know, uh, various things. And I think the pandemic was a great time to do that for people. And I taught some classes on that during the pandemic, but really that's the through line. And when I have taught is just to tell stories and to be aware of what's going on in your community and try to really lean into documenting that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> mm, uh, something I am working towards doing, <laughs> that is an aspiration of mine, but uh, I'm actually really motivated um, behind finishing up my degree and as a result of that, having enough um, real experience to be able to wipe that off for um, young folks who I might be able to mentor in the future. Wow, thank you guys. Um, Y'all have dropped all the gems. Uh, see people, some of the photographers you each mentioned coming up in the chat. Um, I think this can be a really useful conversation um, for photographers, for people working with, with young people um, um, in, for, in lots of ways. Um, and I wanna thank um, Center for Book Arts again for, um, for the organization of the series, but it, all these additional things, like all of these talks go on their uh, YouTube page. They get it up really quickly. So anybody that's joining in now, you know, if you know somebody that would benefit from hearing this conversation, you can share that link with them in a matter of days. Um, the first two conversations are, are already up. Um, so, so you can go there and they're also putting together, I don't know if y'all know this, I think you do. They're putting together a zine um, at the conclusion of this conversation series. Um, so this idea of archive um, showing up in, in lots of different ways, um, digital space, physical space, um, all the things. And next week we are um, speaking on the topic of care, care as resistance and resistance as care. So we hope you'll all join us back for that as well. And did you want to say anything else? Uh, just thank you to yeah. the panelists, Elliot, Simu, Layla. Um, so brilliant. I was definitely emotionally, spirit, spiritually moved by all the work.
which I, I wasn't expecting, but I'm happy, happy to be able to witness all of y'all together, sharing y'all work, talking about y'all work. Appreciate y'all participating. Absolutely. Yeah. So with that, oh, for sure, for sure. With that, we wish you all a happy Wednesday. Um, again, join us next week and take care. Everyone. Everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.